الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على السلام حيا على الفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin 
After reciting the Tashahud, Ta'uz and Surah Al-Fatiha, Hazrat Khalid al-Nasi V, Ayyadullah Ta'ala ibn Sil Aziz stated, A few days ago, a revered member and scholar of the community, respected Usman Jini Sahib, passed away. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Surely to Allah we belong and to him shall we return. God Almighty, through his special decree, brought him to Pakistan from a remote part of China and enabled him to accept Ahmadiyyat. His own writings are available and he has written his own memoirs in which he has shed ample light on his relationship with God Almighty, how he guided him towards accepting Ahmadiyyat, acquiring religious knowledge and subsequently dedicating his life. Now is not the time to give a detailed account of this. Even some of the incidents which he narrated to various people and some of the things which people have written about him and sent to me are written in great detail. It is not possible to give a detailed account of them or to present them in their entirety. These are very faith-inspiring incidents. There is so much information about his circumstances, his life, his services and his character that one could compile a book. In my opinion, Majlis Khudam al Hamdi of Pakistan could fulfill this task in a more befitting manner. Nevertheless, at present, I will speak briefly about the aforementioned Darvesh like individual who was a revered member of the community, life devotee, missionary, and a scholar who practiced what he preached and was a Waliullah. He is a role model for life devotees and missionaries in particular and for every Ahmadi in general. I will speak briefly on what various people have written about his life and character later on. <coughs> Although Usman Jini Sahib was known as Usman Jini, his full name was Muhammad Usman Tsung Shi Chao. He passed away on 13th of April 2018. He was born into a Muslim family on 13th of December 1925 in the Chinese province of Anhui. Upon finishing high school in 1946, he completed a year of advanced studies at the Nancheng University before starting to pursue a degree in politics at the Nancheng National Central University. As he had no interest in politics, he considered studying philosophy of law or religious studies. At first, he says that he intended to study in Turkey. However, he came to Pakistan in 1949. 
Having conducted personal research, he performed the bayt and joined Jami Ahmadiyya. In April 1957, he passed the Shahadatul Ajnaib examination. This used to be a short course for missionaries. He dedicated his life on the 16th of August 1959 and his first appointment was in January 1960. In order to complete the missionary training course, he once again enrolled in Jami Ahmadiyya in April 1961 and graduated in 1964 after having obtained the Shahid degree. He had the opportunity to serve in Pakistan in Vakalte Tasneef Tariqa Jadid in Rabwa as a life devotee and also served as a missionary in Karachi in Rabwa. He had the opportunity to serve in Singapore and in Malaysia in 1966. He remained in Singapore for approximately three and a half years and spent almost four months in Malaysia. He returned to Pakistan in 1970 and served as a missionary in various places. He also had the honor of performing the Umrah and the Hajj to the House of Allah. After the migration of Hazrat Khalif al the fourth Rahimahullah, various offices were established here in London. With the increased workload, a Chinese desk was formed to work on translations of the literature of the community. Thereafter, he was called here to the UK. He had the opportunity to translate books into Chinese. Among them, the Chinese translation of the Holy Quran is especially worthy of mention. He also wrote books on beliefs and the teachings of the community. <coughs> he is survived by his wife, a son and two daughters. With regards to the translation of the Holy Quran in Chinese, in accordance with the guidance of Hazrat Khalid the Masih the Fourth Rahimahullah, he began work on the Chinese translation of the Holy Quran in 1986. In June of the same year, he was called from Pakistan to Britain. Following four years of sustained effort, this translation was completed. Jini Sahib personally writes that the Chinese translation of the Holy Quran demanded a lot of time. Hazrat Khalif al Masih IV Rahimahullah instructed for it to be published on the occasion of the centenary of the Jamaat. He says, I was very apprehensive for the task to be completed on time. I was in search for individuals who could assist in improving the standard of the Chinese language as well as those who could assist with its proofreading. This was extremely difficult living in Pakistan or in the UK. For instance, if an individual was proficient in the Chinese language, he was unfamiliar with Islamic concepts and terminologies. If he was acquainted with the religion, his Chinese was not of adequate standard. This was a very difficult task. Nevertheless, he says, when the translation was completed, I went to China and Singapore under the instructions of Hazrat Khalif the Masih the Fourth Rahimahullah and consulted specialists in the Chinese language in order to improve it. By the grace of God Almighty, a Chinese translation of the Holy Quran was prepared to a high standard. He personally writes with the utmost humility, This task was impossible for me. This is merely the grace of God Almighty through which this was made possible. He further says, Even prior to this, several translations of the Holy Quran in the Chinese language were available, and many other translations were added later, which are several in number. However, the translation of the Ahmadiyya Jamaat holds distinct qualities which cannot be found in any other translation. It contains arguments from the literature of the Jamaat and is thus a masterpiece.
When it was published, various linguists from China and other countries praised it, saying the translation standard was outstanding and commended it. The translation of the Jamaat is well recognized and in great demand. Generally speaking, some people complain as well that the beliefs of the Jamaat have been included in it or that its commentary has been written according to our beliefs. Nonetheless, on the whole, everyone has deemed the translation to be of a high standard. There is a professor in China, Ling Song, who has written a book with regards to Chinese translations of the Holy Quran written in the past century. In this book, he has also made a mention of our translation and has discussed the Jamaat's Chinese translation of the Holy Quran, covering approximately 15 pages in this book. The professor mentions the distinctions of our translation of the Holy Quran very elaborately. For example, he says, Usually when scholars translate, they fail to translate certain words. As a matter of fact, they write the very Arabic words instead of its translation, or they elaborate on these words in footnotes. It seems, therefore, as if these parts were unclear to them. On the other hand, the distinction of the translation of Usman Sahib is that he translates even those passages, and he refers to the supporting references on the basis of the rendered translation in the footnotes. The professor further writes, Having published my comments about this translation, I met Usman Sahib several times. It is my impression, this is the sentiments of a non-Ahmadi, an intellectual professor who considers himself to be an authority on Islam, that he is a simple, humble, sincere and honest man who is devoted to following the commandments of God Almighty. He says this referring to Usman Chini Sahib. He then says, During one Ramadan, I invited him to my home. Usman Sahib observes fasts and considers the Holy Quran to be the highest book of religious law. He further writes, Even though some parts of his translation and commentary are not in accordance with the views of Chinese Muslims who belong to the Sunni sect, is it possible to deny the fact that this person believes in the unity of God, loves the Holy Prophet وسلم, and obeys divine commandments? The English titles of the Chinese literature that was prepared by Chinese Sahib and under his supervision are as follows. He wrote My Life and Ancestry in Chinese. Introduction to Morality in Chinese. These seven books have been written by him. Aside from these, there are approximately 35 books which he translated or which were translated under his supervision. He wrote an outline of Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, which is an introduction to the Jamaat, outline of Islam, which is an introduction to Islam, fundamental questions and answers about Islam, which comprises of basic questions about Islam. Islamic concept of jihad and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in Chinese, Ahmadiyya Muslim community's contribution to the world, he also wrote about the need for Islam and religion in a person's life. These are his scholarly <laughs> achievements which I have briefly mentioned. In relation to his family life, his wife writes, When I received the marriage proposal of Osman Sahib from Pakistan, initially my father did not agree due to the age difference. His wife is also Chinese and says, I was 20 years old at that time and Osman Sahib was almost 50 years old. My father did not inform me about this proposal for several months. When he finally told me, he placed the letter before me so that I could decide for myself. She then says, I saw in a dream that I am standing in a large field in a foreign country, completely empty-handed. Suddenly, the thought of what will happen with me crosses my mind. 
At that time, I saw a person dressed in white in the distance and I heard a voice that all of your requirements will be fulfilled through this person. She further says, After seeing the letter of the proposal, I saw Sman Saib in a dream, dressed in white, and standing beside me whilst I was laying down. When I was shown a picture of Sman Sahib later on, I realized that this was the very person whom I saw in the dream. As a result of this, I accepted this proposal. We were engaged for four years. The passport was not being issued and the circumstances were very difficult there. Due to the political circumstances and the cultural revolution, it was very difficult for her to leave China. She further says, Usman Sahib saw in a dream that when Maud Zaytung passes away, his wife will come. At that time, Mao Tse Tung, who was the chairman of China, was not unwell and was in rather good health, living a comfortable life. Nevertheless, upon this, she said, the wait seemed to be forever and the uncertainty on top of that. Jinni Saib decided to write a letter to Mao Tse Tung. Jinni Saib says, I was on my way to post a letter when I received the news of the demise of Mao Tse Tung. His wife then writes, A few days following his demise, I received my passport. I took my passport and went to the house of my father. When I reached home, it rained heavily throughout the night. Prior to this, there was a severe famine. It rained so profusely that as a result of the great flood of water, some of the ground began to erode away. A non Ahmadi neighbor said to me, You should have come before, so this famine would have come to an end earlier. Nevertheless, she says, After a week I left China. I did not have much with me. I had two pairs of clothes which were given to me by Osman Sahib's younger brother. And apart from this, I had a few cubes of soya sauce. I reached Karachi on 12th of August 1978. There, Jodhri Muhammad Mukhtar Sahib led our nikah and he was personally appointed as my wali, i.e. guardian. On the third day, we had to go to the Chinese embassy. We went by train, which had separate compartments for men and women, and we decided to meet at the station after everyone had left the train. However, prior to this, reaching their destination, as I was new, and as everyone on my carriage left the train, I also disembarked, believing it to be the last stop. When the train started moving again, I realized that this was not in fact the last stop. However, at that time it was difficult to board the train due to the crowd of people. I was extremely worried. Nevertheless, a railway police officer saw me and called for me. He then sent me to the Chinese embassy. She says, I had a veil and was wearing a coat. The people at the embassy could not believe that I was Chinese, as in how could a Chinese woman wear a burqa? They took a Chinese magazine and asked me to read it. A taxi was then organized for my transportation. Nonetheless, it is a lengthy story. Somehow, she arrived at her destination. An Ahmadi man saw them and guided the taxi driver where she needed to go. The taxi driver was also astonished that he had never seen a young woman lost in this manner, only to be found again. She further says, this was the beginning of our life together. About Usman Saib, she writes, He was a good husband. In fact, he was my spiritual guide. When I went to Pakistan, he first taught me how to offer Salat. First, he would lead congregational prayer at the mosque and then come home to lead me in prayers. He would spend hours teaching me the Arabic words of the Salat. He taught me word by word and line by line. He would say that I should keep revising and keep a book of prayers with me in case I forgot. He taught me the preliminary Arabic booklet over the course of six months. 
When teaching me the Holy Quran, he also taught me its translation to keep my interest alive. He was a patient man and would explain things in great depth using different examples. He took good care of his relatives. He called his mother over from China to Pakistan and cared for her. She says, those times were very difficult and they could only afford one bottle of milk a day. Yet, he would give that bottle to his mother. Whenever he went on a journey, he took his mother along with him. Chini Sahib served his mother very well. She says, his life was defined by his devotion to his work. When he was in good health, he would work until late in his office and sometimes would work through the night until the morning. At home, he was most concerned about bringing up his children in a righteous manner. He had no interest in their individual worldly pursuits. He was very simple in his choice of food and clothing. <coughs> His elder daughter, Dr. Kurutul Ain, writes, It is difficult for me to describe my father's attributes in words. He was kind, loving, hard-working, tireless, humble and an optimistic person. He would encourage all his children and later his sons-in-laws to take part in all discussions. He would take a keen interest in our education and would ask what the teachers had said about a particular subject. He would say that the purpose of our lives was to propagate the message of Islam, especially to the Chinese people. He would regularly ask us to keep increasing our spirituality, knowledge and good virtues. He would often say that people should begin believing in God merely by looking at our conduct and personality. As children who believe in God are better than those who do not. He would also say that we should be regular in whatever work we undertook. In our childhood, he never scolded us. He would always explain things in an affectionate manner. The only time he was strict was in regards to the regularity in Salat. In order to inculcate this habit within us, he would go to the mosque for all of the five daily prayers. During school holidays, he would give us books to read and later test us on what we had learnt. She says, He once gave us an old copy of Kashti Anu, i.e. Noah's Ark, and said that we should read it as its language was not as difficult as some of the other Urdu books. He then said that this was the first book that he himself had read whilst he was a student at Jamia Ahmadiyya. He was concerned about his daughters observing Parda while at university. He had instructed them to observe Parda when they were at university and if it was essential to take off the veil, it was only to be for the duration of the classes but then they should not be wearing any makeup. He had sought permission from Hazrat Khalif to Masih the fourth Rahimahullah for them to attend university. He granted permission on the condition that they would also observe Parda and if the veil needed to be removed, it should only be removed for the duration of the class and in that case they should not wear any makeup and it shouldn't be worn again immediately afterwards. His younger daughter Manaza writes, He would say to us that we should aim for the moon so that we would at least obtain the stars, i.e. that we should always aim high. Besides the five daily prayers in congregation, he encouraged his children to offer the tahajjud prayers. He would wake us up for prayers by sprinkling water over us. He 
He would ask us to read the books of the Promised Messiah salam, and the Khulafa. He would sit with us for hours answering our questions patiently and would not be annoyed by small matters. This is an example for all parents. She then says, He always said that we should use our faculties given to us by God Almighty and not waste them. He said that whatever we did, we should do it with the intention of performing an act of God's worship. He would say that spiritual progression was like a staircase. There may be some breaks at times, but it would soon be followed by an upward journey. She further says, He always taught us to prefer others over ourselves. During his time as president of Islamabad Jamaat, once central heating was being installed in all houses, he made sure that his house would be the last to be fitted with it. His son, Dr. Daud Sahib, writes, He once told me that when he received a telegram from China informing him of the sad demise of his father and eldest brother, he was about to sit one of his Jamia exams. He remained focused by saying to himself that the sad news just received was a test from God Almighty in the same way that this Jamia exam was a test, and so he proceeded to sit the exam and did not waste any time. His son further writes, He was very keen to preach to Chinese people. Whenever we used to attend any function, he would introduce Ahmadiyya to the people and distribute literature. Even when his illness rendered him unable to walk and he had to use the wheelchair, he would insist on having some big books in the compartment of his wheelchair so that he could distribute this to the people. His son says, When I was young and would visit my father's office, if I ever tried to use a pen or a pencil from my father's office, he would not allow me to do so. He would say to my mother, Buy him his own pen, as he is in need of one. If we ever had to do some photocopying, he would instruct us to bring the paper from home and only then use the photocopy machine. He further says, he used to instruct us to learn the attributes of God and that we should memorize all the names of God that reflect his attributes. He wrote a poem in the Chinese language venerating all hundred attributes of God. He used to recite this poem every night. He also set a competition between us siblings about who memorized the most attributes of God and would give a prize for that. A few months previously, perhaps two or three months ago, he came to visit me with his son-in-law and his family. His son-in-law writes, As he was unable to speak, he wrote down three points of what he wished me to ask. It said that I am very frail now and unable to stand up by myself. This is why I am sitting in the wheelchair. I apologize for this. He had great reverence for Khilafat. He also said to please pray that until my last breath I continue to preach. He also asked to be allowed to work from home as he was unable to go to the office. This was his commitment to his work. It was not the case that since he is at home, he would sit idle. His desire was to continue to work from home. When he went for Hajj, his son-in-law was with him. He says, Usman Sahib wrote a poem in Chinese expressing his sentiments of supplication. He said, I am recording these sentiments so that I will be able to benefit from these in the future. 
In our Hajj group, there were some other people who asked respected Usman Chini Sahib about what he was writing. He explained to them in brief that I am praying for my fellow Chinese people that may God Almighty bestow them guidance towards the true Islam. At this the person who asked the question was rather astonished that this old frail gentleman who can barely walk without any support is worried for the guidance of his people. Jini Sahib writes in his biography, In China, the teachings of Buddhism, Confucianism and Taoism have all been amalgamated. Many Chinese people follow the teachings of all three of these religions at the same time. However, in this day and age, they have mixed these teachings to invent a new religion. In this religion, a special focus is given to the moral state of an individual. Jini Saib then writes, When my interview was published in three separate Chinese newspapers, the, the Society of Deism Dasta in Malaysia, which is a new religion, also expressed a wish that I should write an article about the moral teachings of Islam. In this way, they could publish the moral teachings of Islam along with the teachings of other religions in their magazine. Therefore, Jini Sahib says that he wrote an article and in return the publishers responded to him by saying, You have written an exceptional article about the teachings of Islam. We are very grateful for this. You have expressed the true teachings of Islam in an unbiased manner and argued your points in depth in a defined manner. This reflects that you have acquired a high degree of knowledge of religions. People in China do not have full understanding of Islam. The reason for this is that there has been limited preaching of Islam in the Chinese language. And now you have come to Singapore to spread the message of Islam. This was when he was in Singapore. It is inevitable that Islam will spread in these countries among the Chinese people and they will gain blessings of this. Aga Sefala Sahib, who was his class fellow or was in Jami at the same time as Chini Sahib, writes, Indeed, he was his class fellow. He writes, Chini Sahib was my class fellow. During the prime of his youth, he was pious, good natured, and had a virtuous conduct. He used to offer salat with extreme devotion and used to supplicate with immense anguish. He would offer voluntary fasts and was in the habit of offering voluntary prayers. He would be preoccupied in the praise and remembrance of God Almighty. He would express extreme gratitude for being blessed with the acceptance of Ahmadiyya and would always show great love, dedication and commitment. He writes, It is a true testimony that when we were students, at times due to being away from home, he would end up in tears. He used to remain quite concerned about seeing his mother and brothers again, about their well-being and about the system of the government in China. Sometimes he used to share his pain. He used to supplicate to God with extreme dedication, heartfelt pain and anguish, seeking his desired objective from the true Creator. He further says, even in this old age, those memories are a source of great pride for me. And the truth of the matter is that whatever this humble servant of God supplicated for during the days of extreme trial, God Almighty granted acceptance to his commitment and supplication and granted him everything because of the blessings of Ahmadiyya. He was blessed with immense mercy. Indeed, other people also benefited from his acceptance of supplications. He then says, During the days when I was a student, due to the grace of God Almighty, I had the blessed opportunity to enjoy the righteous company of Hazrat Ghulam Rasul Rajiki Sahib, Hazrat Malvi Abdul Latif Bawalpuri Sahib, Sahib Zada Sayyid Abdul Hassan Sahib, and other esteemed elders, and have the opportunity to request them for prayers and also witness the impact of the acceptance of those prayers. Agala Sefalo Sahib then says, with due diligence and observation, I can bear witness that in terms of the devotion in the acts of worship, fervency in supplication, extreme dedication, commitment and acceptance of prayers, I could see the reflection of these highly revered people in the personage of Jini Sahib. 
He further writes, I witnessed the acceptance of Jinisai's prayers in many of my personal matters. Jinni Saib always strongly advised me and other people he would meet about prayer and supplication. He was a very wise man who possessed the insight of a believer. He was extremely measured in expressing his opinion regarding the administrative matters of the community. He used to follow the system of the community impeccably and with extreme reverence and always used to encourage his friends and acquaintances to do the same. He had a complete bond of spiritual devotion with the Khilafat and used to express gratitude at his blessings. When anyone made a request for supplicating to him, he would always ask whether or not they have requested the Khalifa for prayers. Dr. Rizwan Sahib, the President of Islamabad Jamaat, writes, His love and devotion to prayers was such that in his last few years, it would take him several minutes to walk in what was only a two to three minute journey from his home to the mosque and he would stop a few times to take a breath. But despite all that, I never saw him combining his prayers. Once, when there was only a short time between Maghrib and Isha prayers, I spoke to him saying that instead of going back home, you should wait in the mosque until the Isha prayer or combine the two. He replied, by walking I will benefit from exercise and will reap the reward of walking from my home to the mosque. So this is why I will go and come back. Rashid Bashiruddin Sahib of Abu Dhabi says, Ahmadis and non-Ahmadis alike would benefit from his prayers. When he was a missionary in Karachi, whilst Drig Road was being constructed, non-Ahmadi men and women would go to him for advice regarding their personal matters and testify to how after acting upon Jinni Sahib's advice and requesting for his prayers, their major issues were all resolved. In brief, the well-known Chinese Muslim scholar of Drig Road, Karachi, was a generous and loving person to all, irrespective of their religious background. Even after moving to England, he was remembered amongst the non-Ahmadis and was talked about for a long time. He says, I also witnessed that Jinni Sai would take great care of his mother. At times, his mother would scold him when she was displeased, but he would quickly express his love for her and took care of her needs. He was so absorbed in doing so that he would not take notice of what was going on around him or who was watching. His love and affection for his mother was extraordinary. Majian of Muhammad Sahib of the Tokmok Jamaat Kyrgyzstan writes, I met Usman Chao Sahib in 1994 on a plane journey. In the beginning, I was not aware that he was a Muslim or that he was a scholar of the Ahmadiyya community. But when the plane was about to take off, he said Bismillah, i.e. in the name of Allah, and then I knew that he was a Muslim. After a while, I said Aslamu Alaikum to him and introduced myself. We started discussing various topics. Then he asked me if I knew of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. I answered in the negative that I was not familiar with them. He then asked me if I had read any Chinese translations of the Holy Quran, to which I replied in the affirmative. He then asked, how many Chinese translations of the Holy Quran are you aware of? I said, however many there are, I have read them all and continue to do so. Usman Chin Sahib then asked, do you know any of the Chinese translators of the Holy Quran? I replied by saying, I know them all. Then he said, one of the translators is called Usman Chao. Do you know him? I answered, yes, I know of him. But I have not yet read his translation of the Holy Quran, nor have I ever met him. He then asked, how do you know Usman Chao? I said, I just know that he is a great scholar and that he has translated the Holy Quran into Chinese, but I am yet to meet him. 
He then said, I am Usman Chow. I could not believe that I was meeting Usman Chow Sahib. He gave me his contact details and I too gave him my details for the place I was staying in temporarily. After a day or two, Jini Sahib rang me saying that he wished to come and meet me. I could never have imagined that such a prominent scholar wanted to come and meet me in my home. I welcomed him to my home and with him were two Pakistani friends. We spoke for 10 minutes, after which Usman Chao Sahib invited me to a restaurant. I told him that since he was a guest, I should be the one to invite him. However, he replied by saying, You are a student and I am your elder, so I am like a parent. Therefore, I should look out for you. Thereafter, we went to the restaurant and had food and discussed different matters. Similarly, one day I went to see him in the central bank building and spoke to him where he was staying. He asked me regarding the death of Jesus, finality of prophethood, Gog and Magog, the Imam Mahdi, and about the Quran and our Hadith. I gave him the same conventional answers that the Sunni Muslims give, and Usman Chao Sahib smiled and gave the true answers to these questions. I had no words with which to respond and his answers had a profound effect on me. He also gifted me the translation of the Holy Quran and some other books and said to read them and to write what I felt about them. Hence, I read them and my way of thinking changed completely. At that time, I did not know of the bed, so I took the oath of allegiance later on. He also writes, I always deemed it an honor to have gained knowledge of the advent of the Imam Mahdi and his true Jamaat. Many people have written incidents about the acceptance of his prayers. Shad Sahib writes, On one occasion we were travelling from Rabba to Karachi by train. There were approximately 60 atfal with us as there was an atfal program. On the way we prayed in congregation and the non-Ahmadis realized that we are Ahmadis. The Malvis began delivering speeches in all the carriages that there should be some action taken against us. We were very worried. Usman Chini Sahib was also with us. Different people were assigned duties in terms of security and Chini Sahib said that he should also be given a duty. I told him that your duty is to sit on the berth and pray. The Malvis planned to take action and also beat us once they reached Multan. However, we passed Multan and there was an air of silence from the Mulvis. When we went to find out why, we saw that he fell asleep. He was supposed to disembark at Multan, but had slept to the point that he missed the Multan station, having not woken up. He then got off at the next station, and in this way we were saved. Similarly, Adnan Zafar Sahib writes, my case in the Home Office was not moving forward at all. Many a time I asked about my passport, but they said that they did not have any record of me being in the UK. In this way, I would take leave from work for three to four months to go there, and in the end, I was in despair. One day I met Chini Sahib in Islamabad. After offering my prayers, he was on his way home when I mentioned this issue of mine with regards to my passport. He raised his hands to pray there and then. His supplication was so emotional and that he was wailing in his prayer so much that I became afraid. I was anxious that he was praying so profusely for me and I have troubled him for no reason. Other people too joined in this prayer. The next day when my lawyer rang the home office, no one was attending the call. It was ringing for a long time until the director, who was walking by, came and attended the call. He informed him of the situation and the director replied that I should come and meet him in his office in the morning. When I went to the office, 
I inform the receptionist that I have come to meet Mr. Richard, who was the director. The receptionist said, he is an officer of high rank, why would he meet you? Tell us what is your situation. I said no, he has called me himself, but no one was willing to inform the director. Eventually, one person who was willing to help me went and informed him. Mr. Richard came out of his office and accompanied me to his room. He looked through all the records on his computer. He then called his secretary, gave her a sheet saying my passport should be issued right away. Thereafter, he accompanied me outside his office. All the workers there were watching this and asking, who is this important foreigner for whom the high officer came out of his office and opened the door for him to leave? What could I say to them? At that time, I was in such a state that as a result of the tender prayers of Usman Chini Sahib, my issue, which had been suspended for four months, was resolved within a day. And on top of that, it was done at the hands of a high officer. <clears throat> there are countless other incidents, all of which cannot be mentioned due to the sheer volume. I shall read out a few from his close friends. Sayyid Hussain Ahmed Sahib, a missionary, writes, we used to have weekly meetings. Missionaries did not own any vehicles, so we would take the train and the meetings would go on till late into the night. After it was over, we would return with an Amla member from the meeting and wait until they would go. However, Usman Chini Sahib never waited and would either walk back or if he saw a bus or someone else on the way, he would go with them. The area where he was staying in the mission house had only a small space. One day he invited us after we inquired as to where he was staying. He showed us his room and said, this is the hall for the women and when they come to pray I gather all my belongings and then return when they are finished. This is where I sleep and eat etc. He stayed in a small room with great humility and modesty. Rashid Arshad Sahib worked with him for a very long time in the Chinese desk. He says, I had the opportunity to work with him for 33 years. And his qualities were such that he was regular in the congregational prayers and completely absorbed in his worship. He was an example for all of us. No matter if it was raining, snowing or there was a storm, he would regularly go to the mosque. We even saw him in such a condition where due to old age he became very frail. As mentioned previously, when coming from his house in Islamabad to the mosque, which was only a few minutes distance away, he would cover that in 15 to 20 minutes and stop to breathe. But no matter what, he would come to the mosque. He regularly performed the Tahajjud prayer. Once when we were in China, we travelled a long distance and spoke to the Ahmadis there for a long time. I thought that it would be difficult to wake up for the Tahajjud prayer. Yet in the morning, I saw that Chini Sahib was offering the Tahajjud prayer. Even if it was brief, he would never break his routine. Chini Sahib himself wrote that when he came to Rabwa from China, he witnessed how the elders of Rabwa would pray with great fervency and passion, fast, perform the itikaf and make supplications. God Almighty would listen to their supplications. This had a deep impact on him and he vowed that he would also follow in the footsteps of these elders. At that time, he had the guidance of Hazrat Khalif Tumasi II as well as the opportunity to sit in the company of great personalities such as Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmed Sahib and Hazrat Mirza Sharif Ahmed Sahib. He would derive benefit from sitting in the company of Mulana Ghulam Rasul Rajiki Sahib, Hazrat Mukhtar Ahmed Sahib Shah Jahanpuri, Hazrat Muhammad Ibrahim Sahib Bakapuri, Sayyid Waliullah Shah Sahib, and others. Through keeping company with these noble elders, God Almighty further polished his character. 
and also increased his relationship with God. He further writes, <coughs> He was extremely passionate in matters of tabligh. Usually he had a quiet temperament and would speak less. However, we have seen many times that when he would be engaged in tabligh, he would have extraordinary strength and passion which enabled him to talk for hours on end. On many occasions, if he would speak on the phone, he would not worry for the time and hours would pass by. He inherited the quality of hospitality of guests. He would often say that his father was very hospitable. His father would say that as there is no hotel in the village, our house is the hotel. Jinni Sahib's wife would also fully support him in matters of hospitality. <coughs> Similarly, he would always care about the sentiments of others, irrespective of how tired he may be. On one occasion, a meeting was conducted until late. When they sat in the car, someone requested that his house is nearby and he should go and visit. Rishi Rashid Sahib says, We thought that he would decline. However, he agreed to go. The gentleman had prepared dinner for them. They sat until late and arrived home approximately 1 a.m. He did not decline the request of the gentleman, nor did he say that he has to leave quickly. Nasir Ahmad Badr Sahib, who is a missionary, writes, when I was instructed to learn Chinese, I contacted Chini Sahib. In China, I had the opportunity to preach the message of Islam in several areas. During those times, I benefited greatly from Chini Sahib's guidance and direction. He would guide me through written letters. He then says, I had the opportunity to speak to thousands of Chinese people and also give them booklets containing the message of the Promised Messiah. He further says, Everywhere I went, Jinni Sahib was spoken highly of and amongst the Muslims in China, he is considered to be an eminent scholar. He continues by saying, The literature that he has written will never allow him to be forgotten. The ink that flowed from his pen is an ocean of wealth in terms of the work he has carried out in translation and writing books in the Chinese language. His eloquence and articulation of the Chinese language has an attraction which has a captivating effect. He then says, I understood this fact when I went to a madrasa in China. When I visited for the first time, they did not prepare anything special and showed no interest in my visit. The madrasa is situated in a Muslim populated area. However, after a short while when I visited again, all the Muslims, including the Imam, greeted me with a lot of love and affection. I asked from one of the locals that when I visited for the first time, I was not shown as much love and affection as is being exhibited on this visit. Upon this, the local Chinese gentleman said, The Chinese books that you gave to our Molvi Sahib, especially the translation of selected writings of the Promised Messiah, were such that they are recited in the sermons. Listening to them has an incredible trance-like effect on us. We have never heard such extraordinary piece of writing in our entire lives. We therefore wish that you should bring us more books like this. He then further says, I had the opportunity to visit Jinni Sahib's ancestral village and met with his family and friends. All of them would speak about Usman Chao Sahib with the utmost love and respect. Every one of them would express great joy in explaining their relation to Usman Chao Sahib. He further says, For the remainder of my stay, all of them took care of me and showed great hospitality simply because I knew Usman Chao Sahib and that I was a representative of the Ahmadiyya community. He goes further to say, The translation of the Holy Quran by Usman Chao Sahib is very comprehensible and can easily be understood by everyone. But at the same time, 
it articulates the eloquence of the Chinese language. Therefore, although other translations of the Holy Quran in Chinese are available, Usman Chao Saib's translation is widely accepted throughout China and is considered an authority. I realize this fact having met with a range of Muslim Chinese scholars who despite holding views that are contrary to the Jamaat, yet they value this translation very highly and in order to understand the Holy Quran they use it devoutly. He further states, during my visit of the region I met with an elderly Imam Seeing a copy of the translation in my hand, his face lit up. He had a copy of Chini Saib's translation in his hand. He was elated to see this translation and repeatedly said, I have been in search of this translation for a long time. Would you be able to give me a copy of this? I informed him that at present we only have one copy of the translation. However, if he gave me his address, we would obtain one copy from Usman Chao Saib. He thought about it and then said, if you permit me to borrow this copy for a short while, I can make a photocopy of it. This book consisted of 1450 pages and seeing this gentleman's desire to simply photocopy the book, we gave him the copy to keep. He was overjoyed and repeatedly thanked us as if we had given him a piece of priceless treasure. Undoubtedly, it is a treasure. Nevertheless, he was unable to control his emotions of joy. Similarly, he had ties with a vast number of people. All the missionaries who have served there have all written saying that wherever they would go in China, Jinni Sahib was spoken highly of. Zafrullah Sahib, who is a missionary currently stationed in Pakistan, has also served there in China. He writes, in 2004, when Chini Sahib visited Pakistan, on the way from Islamabad to Rabwa, he took me to Kalar Kahar. This is where he would come for spiritual retreat during the time he was a student in Jamia. He narrated one incident of his in which his prayer was accepted. During this seclusion, he visited a couple who had been married for 10 years. However, they did not have any children. They requested Chini Sahib for prayers in this regard. Jini Sahib prayed for them and saw in a dream that Chaudhary Zafrullah Khan Sahib was resting on a charpai in their courtyard. He related this dream and gave them tidings that God Almighty will grant them a son. Thus, a while later, God Almighty bestowed them with a son. I also remember the time when he would go for his seclusion in Kalakahar. It was during the time of Hazrat Khalip the Masih II of the Allahu Anhu and I was fairly young. On one occasion when I visited the place, he was sitting in a small room with a copy of the Holy Quran in his hand and was reciting the prayers. All of us, young and old, then requested him for prayers. He replied with a smile on his face and would always show kindness to everyone. Dr. Nuri Sahib writes, During a checkup in 2004, 14 or 15 years ago, we discovered that he has a heart condition which cannot be treated. He says, I was very worried because with the exception of prayer and a few small remedies, there is no treatment for such a condition. The survival chances of such people are severely reduced and they do not survive beyond a few years. Dr. Sahib writes, however, by the grace of Allah, I met Chini Sahib many times. Despite his illness and signs of progressive weakness, he never allowed his illness to hinder him from fulfilling his work commitments and would always be occupied in his work. He never let his illness prevent him from working or stop him from worship. In fact, someone has written that on one occasion, it had snowed heavily. We thought that seeing as it was difficult to even walk due to the snow, nobody would be able to go for Fajr, or at least it would be difficult for Jini Sahib to come to the mosque. Nevertheless, we went to open the mosque. When we were outside, we saw footprints in the snow. Inside the mosque, we saw that Chini Sahib had not only made his way to the mosque, but in fact he had arrived early and was performing the Hajjid prayers.
Atal Mujib Rashid Sahib has written about him, which is an accurate summary and is in complete accord with the truth. He writes, He has left behind a large void. He was a man of lofty character. He then says, I was pondering over Chini Sahib's attributes. Among them was that he was always occupied in worship and had his prayers accepted. He was extremely punctual in offering his prayers. Despite his illness and weakness, he would always go to the mosque. He was a pious, saintly man who did not look to harm anyone. He would always want the best for everyone and would give sound advice to all. He was a simple and honest man. He was very hospitable and would always show great generosity to his guests. He was extremely courageous. Despite his frailty, he was always active in serving the faith. He would discharge his responsibilities with full effort, sincerity and passion. His desire and dedication to serve the faith was very evident. He was a humble and truly loyal servant of Khilaf Ahmadiyya. He would meet everyone unreservedly with a beaming smile as well as countless other qualities. Whatever has been mentioned is absolutely true. May Allah the Almighty continue to elevate the status of respected Usman Chini Sahib and grant patience and steadfastness to his wife and also become her helper and guardian. Furthermore, may God Almighty enable his children to become the recipients of his prayers and virtues and enable them to follow in his footsteps. After the prayers, I will lead his funeral prayer in absentia, inshallah.